possible options. First one was, we'll invade Cuba. Second one was, we'll bomb Cuba. And the third one was that we will establish a quarantine. The quarantine was the naval blockade that started on October 22, 1962. No ships could go into Cuba. And there were a number of Soviet freighters that were headed in that direction. On October 28, 1962, Khrushchev and Kennedy reached an agreement. The agreement was that the United States would publicly announce that they would not invade Cuba and that privately we would remove the Jupiter missiles along the Turkish border. Khrushchev agreed to stop construction of the missile bases and remove the IL-28 nuclear bombers from Cuba. On November 22nd, 1962, the last bomber left and that's when the quarantine or naval blockade was lifted. However, during that time, the United States had something that was called the Polar Defense. We had over 200 Knight Hercules missile bases up the East Coast, across our northern border, and down the western side of the United States. But it had an Achilles heel, because if we ever expected an attack, we thought it would come over the polar ice cap. We didn't expect an attack from the southern border, from the Caribbean, South, or Central America. And obviously, that did not bear out. So on October 28, 1962, out of Fort Bliss, Texas, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was an emergency deployment of a Nike Hercules missile battery out of Fort Bliss, Texas. At midnight, the soldiers were told, get on the train. Of course, the soldiers would always say, they asked, where are we going? And the Army, as it always says, you'll find out when you get there. And where they got to was two miles outside of Everglades National Park amidst the tomato and bean fields. They placed the missiles on the ground and the tents on the ground. Now, some of the local farmers came by and said, hey guys, you know, when it rains here, it floods. The Army doesn't always listen to civilians. First rainstorm came, missiles sank, all the tents got soaked, so they set up some wooden platforms. Now. This was not considered particularly good duty because your neighbors were rats, snakes, alligators, mosquitoes, and for the fun of it, we threw in a hurricane every once in a while. Now, the rats were so bad that at night sometimes they would walk around with handguns and shoot the rats. Now, where you're standing at right now used to be what was called the hole in the donut. This was a 3,300 acre aioli tomato farm surrounded by Everglades National Park. They borrowed money from the federal government. They went bankrupt. So all of a sudden, you got 3,300 acres that are available. National Park Service raised their hand and said, we'll take them. The Army said, we want to build some missile bases, so we'd like 700 acres. I'll let you imagine the very friendly and amicable discussions that took place between the Army and the National Park Service about building a base inside of a national park. After all of the adjectives had been utilized, a call came from Washington and the National Park Service ordered or issued a temporary building permit. As you can see how temporary this is. They finished the base in 1965. Oh, by the way, for the first three years when the soldiers were out on the field, once a week they got to go, they got to go to Homestead Air Force Base to take a shower. Otherwise, they were on their own. Base was finished in 65. Double fencing, barbed wire, K9 24-7, armed patrols with orders to shoot to kill trespassers because in 66 we got nuclear warheads. You have two warheads here. Conventional, which is high explosive, and the nuclear warheads. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. Now, the missiles, if you'll excuse me a second, were placed, there'll be one on this pad, one on the next pad, one on the third pad. There would have been three more missiles inside for a total of six in each one of the batteries or three barns, 18 missiles. One missile would always have been on 24-7 alert on an 87 degree angle. I'm glad you asked young lady why an 87 degree angle. Excellent question. Two reasons. One, it facilitated the trajectory of the missile. The second one was that the initial thruster burned for 3.4 seconds and then 
drop back down to earth. Where did you not want it to land? On the base. Now, these berms that you see here would have been to protect the soldiers from the missiles when they were fired. There was a bunker underneath this one. Right now it's not open to the public because it has asbestos and lead paint, and all it is is a black rectangle with nothing in it. How do I know that? Because I opened the door, okay, and then I closed it. Now, the soldiers love going into the bunker. I'm glad you asked once again, why did they love going into the bunker? Very good question. Whenever there was an alert, the soldiers would go in there. The bunker was air conditioned. And if you've ever been here in the summer, high humidity, high heat, and that's a good place to go into. Now, the missile itself would have is 41 feet long. Travels three quarters of a mile in a second, 40 miles in a minute, reaches an altitude of 100,000 feet, over 100,000 feet, and has a range of 90 miles. It is a anti-aircraft defensive weapon proximity exploded. What do I mean by proximity exploded? The sophistication of the technology was not enough to be able to hit the airplane. So what you would do is there was a bomber coming, you get it close enough, you explode it, it would destroy it. Okay? Now, two types of warheads. One would have been the conventional high explosive. If you have one or two bombers coming, that's what you would utilize. If you had a fleet of bombers coming, and don't forget there were 42 in Cuba, you would use one of the nuclear warheads. Nuclear warheads was up to 40 kilotons, three times the strength of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. The fleet was coming, you'd explode it over the airplanes and compress them into the ground. Now, an I Hercules missile was never fired at an enemy. It was fired in one of three places. White Sands Missile Testing Site for training. Beautiful park, by the way, if you ever get a chance to go in New Mexico. Second place, Alaska, tested under cold weather conditions. Third one, over the Pacific, to test a nuclear warhead. There were actually four Nike Hercules missile bases in South Florida. One in Key Largo, one here, one at the Chrome Detention Center now, about 20 miles away, and one in Carroll City, about 35 miles away. Now, that would have been a total of 72 missiles that were available. In 1962, this became a highly militarized zone, South Florida. I lived here at that time. I saw Hawk missiles, which would have been, which would have been utilized to shoot down low-flying airplanes like the MiG-21s. I saw batteries of Hawk missiles going down US-1. Hawk missiles were placed in Miami Beach on the beach. They were placed in Key West Beach on the beach. Highly militarized zone, the first time that the Army had two missiles under one command, the Hawks and the Nike. The Nikes would have been used for the supersonic bombs. Okay, now. Okay, now, when you came in, you drove that nice long road. The soldiers used to race their vehicles up and down those roads. Okay, that wasn't a heck of a lot to do. The bulk of the bases were underground on the rest of the U.S. Here, a lake was formed on the other side of that fence in order to create the fill to build this base. When the soldiers would race their cars, if one of them cracked up and they couldn't repair the vehicle, or another soldier had a vehicle here and they were sent an emergency deployment, nobody wanted the vehicle, they'd go like this into the lake. I'm glad you asked that question. Where are you? Yes. Why did they go into the lake and how do we know? Two reasons. First of all, one of the soldiers told us. Second one is this base, which was the last Nike Hercules missile base to be decommissioned, was decommissioned in 1979. The park acquired the property back in 1981 and they became, they, they started reclaiming some of the land. By reclamation, we mean returning it to its original state. So they had a lake there that said, shouldn't be here. So they drained the lake. They found not one, not two, not three, not four, 
not five, but six vehicles have been dumped in the lake. They took those vehicles out. As a matter of fact, I have a picture sitting over there you can take a look at showing you how that took place. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest that we ever came to nuclear war. There was only one casualty during the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was Major N. Anderson. A Cuban SAM missile battery fired a missile without authorization that shot the plane down and killed it. We could have gone to nuclear war over that. There were two nuclear Soviet submarines in the Caribbean that had nuclear torpedoes. They were being shattered by our destroyers. Our destroyers were trying to get them to come to the surface by dropping these containers on it that were not depth charges, but sounded like depth charges. Those captains had permission to have fired their nuclear torpedoes. They did not. Reasonableness prevailed over something that was an illusion of control. And what I mean by illusion of control is that we're dealing with peculiar animals called human beings. And as we all know, we sometimes do things that are awfully right, sometimes not so good. Fortunately, at that time period, saner heads prevailed, and that's why we're all here. Because like I said, 